Hello and welcome to Long Beach Lens. I'm your host, Derek J. Simpson, Executive Director of the Long Beach Community Action Partnership. Our first guest is the Executive Vice Chairman for Bridging the Gap and founder for Rock to Recovery. Please welcome Wesley Gear. Hi, thanks, thanks for, for having me. Hey, man, yeah. it's a pleasure. Yeah. I've heard a lot about you from uh, Marissa Semense uh, nice. on our, our management team. Old and friend. Then I did some research and I was like, whoa. So we just stepped our game up having you here. Thanks. Oh, all right. I'll, <laughs> I'll take it. I'm glad you didn't hear about me from the police department. Well, I got that record too, but I was trying to stay away from that, man. I'm trying, trying to, to get an expunge, you know? <laughs> well, we've got Prop 47 help here too, but we'll get into that later. <laughs> so, Wesley, um, your background as a musician, mm -hmm. just share with those who are watching a little bit about you. Uh, I moved a lot as a kid, and uh, when I moved and I was 15, around there, 14 or 15, I, I discovered the guitar. I'd been exposed to music my whole life, but I think uh, when you're young, it didn't have much of a meaning. I, I grew up with classical music, it was just like a part of life, but then when I heard rock guitar, about 15, moved to a new place, didn't have any friends, that was my best friend. That was it. Huh? Yeah, that was it. Yeah. And then I, I tell us about Head P.E. What, what was I, that about? Yeah, I had a bunch of really you know, not so great bands, and then right. we kind of made a hybrid of some local bands that could get a few hundred people to shows, um, right. and the singer and I started Head P.E., uh, Jared, and then brought in some other bandmates, and that got, got me my first record deal okay. on Jive Records. We were talking before yeah. the camera started rolling. Yeah. Yeah. We called it G-Punk because we were fusing, like, because we loved gangster rap, all the Snoop Dogg stuff, and we loved, you know, the punk rock, rudimentary P9, and we were trying to fuse the stuff together, and uh, Jive's a hip hop label, you right. know. They started Absolutely. East Coast hip hop, so what, they wanted to sign us out here. And we're like, "What? Okay, <laughs> yeah, that sounds real good to us." <laughs> right. You know? right. And then, so you're rolling, and then all of a sudden, 2003, you have something that changes in your life as well. Well, the reality is of my record deal is I had bands that didn't do so well, and then I got really into getting loaded and heavy drugs and then my band started doing really well head I got a record deal while I was on a lot of drugs so I thought well this is my spinach like Popeye you know mm -hmm. uh, but mm -hmm. and so for a while I felt like I had magic powers on that stuff and then slowly the things I thought it was doing for me it was actually start working in reverse right mm -hmm. I wasn't creative I wasn't functional I wasn't making more friends being more artistic and I toured, you know, the world for a while, drinking a lot of whiskey and doing a lot of that stuff we do. And then finally, uh, it ended me up in a rehab. Yeah. Now, when you say you toured the world, I also read about you being with Corn from yeah. 2010 to 13. How did that transition happen from your own group uh, to Corn? Was that all a part of that same period of time? It's quite a testament to the path of recovery. Um, as you can tell, I'm not a spring chicken. Um, <clears throat> I left head. I want to say in my late 30s, and uh, I did this thing they called recovery. They said, you put your recovery first. Don't worry about the job or the house or the wife or any of those things you want. Focus on recovery and getting healthy. And it was a long, slow process. My brain said, uh, you're not going to play music again, right? You're sober now, and sober people don't play music. And that's the problem with people when they get sober is their brain tells them things that aren't true, but you don't go, hey, brain, you're lying to me. You right. go, yeah, that's true. Right? Right, right? So, but people told me you, you can have the white, uh, life of your wildest dreams, you stay sober. And so, after I was sober about three years the second time, because I got loaded again in about two years when I stopped working on recovery. So, it was about sec uh, two years in, the second time, um, I started praying and meditating, and going, Universe, I think I want to get back into music. I think I have some unfinished business there. And right about 10 days after I did this meditation for manifestation, mm -hmm. where you visualize it, I got a, I got a text from the guys in Corn. Hey, wow. you want to come play with us? I was like, whoa, <laughs> this is weird. This prayer meditation stuff everybody's been right. talking about for thousands and thousands of years right, right, works, right. you know. Yeah. Um, and I got, got to tour with Corn. Uh, they wanted me in the band because I was sober. Ah. So that lie of my head saying music right, and sobriety right. don't mix, the right. universe was like, no, you're a musician. And right. uh, I got to do that and go around the world and remember shows and be present and play well right. and not all drunk. Totally different perspective, huh? Oh, it was the best thing ever. And, and I got to deal with the fear, too, because I was, you know, I made a, a habit my whole life of, uh, of, you know, numbing myself out, not feeling the right. past, not feeling the present. Um, so... You know, part of recovery is we get stronger because we go through the stuff we used to do loaded, sober. And when you learn how to do it sober, you're now a stronger person. So 
I got to play Blind, which is Korn's, like, you know, most famous uh, song, you know, trademark song. I'd have to do the intro by myself on a crowd of 80,000 people. Wow. It's not even a hard part, but my heart is doing bat- backflips, <laughs> you know, because I know all the Korn fans are listening. Don't screw this up. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah, usually I'd have a few shots of whiskey get me through this. And, uh, and so, yeah, it, that, that's the beauty of the experience, well, too. Whiskey to, fe- to adrenaline getting you yeah, through. Yeah, feeling. We want to yeah. feel, right? right and, right, you know, right. the, the people who uh, struggle with addiction, they don't want to feel. You know? So for those who are watching who may be struggling or who have friends who are struggling, when, when you start to find that road to recovery, I would imagine those old friends who are still there and stuck, that might must be somewhat of a, a distraction too, where they're like, why yeah. are you trying to go that way, come back this way? How yeah. do you become strong enough to, to break away from all of that and, and stay on that, the right path? Well, you know, for me, I didn't do it my way. I didn't go, here's my plan for recovery, because I tried to change a long time. I let people tell me what the suggestion was for success. Okay. So okay. I went to a treatment center in uh, Long Beach, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. newfound life and I went for I, I told him I just want to go 30 days and about 20 days in I was like I'm not ready for the world yet I, I'm barely you know coming out of the clouds out of the fog so I did that for a couple of months and then they said you know we recommend you go to a sober living and that's what I did so I had to take that ego of like hey I was on a tour bus look at me and go okay I'll share a room with a few dudes who wake me up and keep because they kept me safe I wasn't ready to go back to Huntington Beach and I had to make a new network of friends and it wasn't that they had to be my best friends necessarily, but they had to be like if we are in battle, right? right. I may not know you, but we got to save each other's lives right. and get each other's back. Right. And that's what that. it's about. Yeah. So I had a posse of people who were on the same path as, as I was, which is let's not get loaded no matter what. Right. Now, as you're going through all of this, I understand, too, you got to that place where you found that it wasn't just about you. It was about giving back to the community, and that became really important to you as well. Yeah, you know, the truth of that whole thing is that um, when you're a musician, it, nothing is guaranteed. It could go away tomorrow, you know, and, there's a, and the, that, that always had me living with a lot of fear. So this time when I was in that position with Korn that had a lot of notoriety, and, you know, and it gave me a lot of visibility as a person and it makes people listen to what you say and the ideas you have. You know, there's some spiritual texts I was reading in my recovery and the, the whole time I was talking to God, like, you know, I need a career. <laughs> what do you want me to do? And it says you can pray for yourself if others are to be helped, right? Don't just go give me a million dollars. So I said, okay, God, I'm an alcoholic, I'm a drug addict, and I'm a musician. How can I help people but uh, using what I've been given in my life? And that's when the idea of Rock to Recovery came to me. Mm-hmm. Like, why don't you just go write songs with people in treatment? Um, so I went down that path with, uh, with doing something, giving backward, Greg. Right? Right. It started as a nonprofit, and then what I'm here for. Right, and that's bridging the gap. Bridging so the gap. We have five minutes, and I want to make sure you get a chance to talk about that. And I know we have a guitar. We, we, we bring that in yet, or what do you sure, think? Sure, why not? How about that? Yeah. Yeah. So tell us about bridging the gap and what you've got here as well. All right, so um, yeah, it's a nice little axe, as we call it, right? Yeah. Um, Bridging the Gap, I had a good friend named Duke Collins, and we played backyard parties together, clubs together in my original, my first band, Head P.E., and we partied together, and, uh, you know, I went on to get sober, and uh, he was struggling in and out, you know, because we have this mindset saying, no, I got this, I'll get it right this time, and uh, unfortunately, he didn't get it. He he passed away from a drug overdose. so again, back to the prayer and meditation, you know, if you, if I heard the story from the other side long ago, I probably wouldn't have believed it, but I started, I've got in this practice of sometimes talking to like my father who passed away, and I swear I get, I hear their voices. Mm-hmm. So I hadn't talked to Duke in a while, he had been, he passed on, right? And I, I was praying and meditating, and I was like, hey Duke, how you doing, man, miss you, and I was just having this conversation in my mind, and I said, uh, I said, well, is there anything you want me to do down here? And I heard this thing, get a hold of my mom. I was like, oh, okay, get a hold of your mom. I didn't know Duke's mom. And within the next 24 hours, I think, or 48 hours, we connected. And she's like, yes, I got a message from Duke that we are supposed to connect. I'm getting chills right now thinking about it. Wow. And she goes, I, wanna, I want to uh, 
not have his passing be for nothing. Um, I want to form a charity uh, organization in his name. Now, Duke's issue was that he had a functional life. And he wasn't against going to treatment. But how do you sustain that life when you do? The car payment, the house payment, how, how life, the, you know, the people want to get paid. Right, right. And that was his thing that he spoke to his mom about. Yeah, mom, I, I know I need help. He, you know, they had a great relationship, but, but how do I put my life on hold? So bridging the gap is in his honor, uh, designed to help people um, financially when they have to go away and get treatment and get help. Um, and so <clears throat> we're going to do it where when people go to treatment and they and we know they have a program of recovery they're following, mm -hmm. will help them financially if they're sticking to their program, not just freebies, but like, yeah, you're going to the meetings or whatever you need, whatever we decide is the, the, the plan of treatment. Um, so that, that's what bridging the gap's all about. We don't want to lose people. We don't have to lose right. unnecessarily. And how will the guitar play into this? So bridging the gap is brand new. And another one of my homies who did play in uh, Suction, which turned into Deadlights, that was Duke's band, the Deadlights, amazing band, uh, Jerry Montano. He's friends with the guys in Avenged Sevenfold. I think most of you out there in TV land know who that is. See everybody back there shaking their heads. Yeah, yeah. Avenged Sevenfold. Those guys are badass. Can I say badass? Well, you did. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is a guitar that they um, that Jerry talked to them about, and they donated, and they put all their autographs on here. Um, the whole band, which is amazing. Sometimes you get one or two guys, but this has a whole band on it, and it's a... It's a legit, good guitar, really nice, made by Schechter, who donated it. And uh, what we're going to do is auction this baby off okay. to help raise some money for Bridging the Gap. And how do people find out about the auction? So right now, the best way to find out about it is we're going to put it on a site called Give Some. Yes, and we'll put it on our Facebook page, Bridging okay. the Gap Recovery. Can we do some words at the bottom yeah, of the screen in post-production? Oh, yeah. So see right here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't know, but we'll give you that information. It's Bridging okay. the Gap Recovery, and we have a Facebook page called Bridging the Gap. Okay. We'll have information. It's going to be on an eBay auction. Cool. Um, if you use keywords like Bridging the Gap and Avenge Sevenfold Autograph, you'll be able to find it for sure. We're out of time, man, but you've given a lot of information. I wish I had a whole show with you. We got to bring you back. I think we back. covered it, Will though. Will you come back again? Yeah, I'd love to. Okay. Yeah, for yeah, sure. Maybe we can even get you to do a few licks for us. While okay, yeah, for All sure. Right, no problem. We're going to take a short break. When we come back, we will be speaking with Yegi Kaela Watts of Heart C Comprehensive Development. Stay tuned for more of Long Beach Lens. I'm Deborah. Are you tired of coming home to an empty, lonely house? Why not try Animal Match Rescue Team? We are a small dog rescue group in Long Beach. AMRT is looking for loving homes and has a variety of small dogs to choose from. Just come to Petco 6500 PCH any weekend from 11 to 2 to see just a few of our little dogs. To find out how you could adopt, foster, volunteer, or donate, go to amrt.net. 100% of all proceeds go to our animals. Right, Pearl? You'll be glad you did. It's very pet friendly. Everybody has a dog in Long Beach. It's Dog City. Well, there's everything to do here. You got the pike, you got Queen Mary, you got the beaches, you got paddle boarding, surfing. You go half a mile that way, you got surfing, you got downtown. I just think it's the most most incredible, most beautiful, most unique city, which has so much to offer. So I love it here and I'll never leave. Welcome back. I'm your host, Derek J. Simpson. Our next guest is here to tell us about Heartsea Comprehensive Development. Let's welcome Yegi Kayla Watts. Thank you. Did I get it right? You did. You just rolled <laughs> off my lips there. There you go. So. You're a behavioral therapist, yes. you're a songwriter, and uh, you want to address the needs of children in a very unique way. Tell us about it. Absolutely. Um, I have worked in special education for almost 15 years, okay. uh, primarily with children with autism um, in the field of applied behavior analysis, ABA. Um, but I am also an artist and a singer-songwriter. And so um, 
I've kind of had this balance in my career of, of you know, going in one direction and reaching a point where I wanted to incorporate my passion um, for the arts and see what type of impact that can have on the overall development of these children that I work with. Now you said so, you had a personal life experience that sort of launched this new perspective. Can I did. Can you share anything about that? <laughs> um, I've had many personal life experiences, but um, just this last year I kind of reached a point uh, working for a local school district where I started to see the frustration and the aggression of these children and um, on a whole other level, on more of a holistic level, because I think so often as behavior interventionists, we become desensitized to the fact that these children are living human beings with hearts and souls and need an outlet um, to be able to express themselves. And so I did my research and um, had a, an incident with a student where I was injured and it was um, kind of a turning point for me where you know it wasn't that child's fault but there were so many pieces missing and um, I wanted to create an opportunity for children who engage in those behaviors and, and not just special needs but also general ed students um, and disadvantaged youth to express themselves through art, music, yoga and have that sensory integration kind of implemented into that program. And you say you realized like the, the therapeutic impact of music. How, how did that occur? Um, what did you realize? Well, for myself, personally, um, I went through a lot of life changes in my 20s. And um, I've always had a, a heart for music and art, but never really pursued it until I went through a divorce. Mm -hmm. And um, that life changing experience for me at 28 um, really opened up the door to discover who I was and how to get through this life and the struggles, and uh, my daughter was one at the time. And so um, through that period of time, I just picked up a guitar and I just began, began to sing and write and the songs came pouring out and I gave my daughter her first crayons when she was one and it's just been a therapeutic family um, experience going through you know, all of our emotions and expressing ourselves to each other through art and music. Now your vision is to create the first comprehensive development center in the region to serve yes. children with autism, ADHD, and other learning and behavioral difficulties. And I know you talked about this summer actually yeah. uh, launching that path. Tell us about that. Absolutely. Um, so there are wonderful programs available out there. There are, you know, and we have a school district that's really trying and, and using all avenues to reach the needs of these children, but there's kind of a point where there are limitations. Right. And so when I did my research, I, there were some great programs that I found, nonprofit, for-profit, um, but very few were focused on the whole child. Gotcha. There were either um, art programs, primarily for children, um, typ neurotypical children, but didn't really cater to children with special needs. Mm -hmm. There are occupational therapists who have to be contracted and are covered through insurance um, where you know perhaps other children would benefit from some of those strategies in a, in a program that balances with also um, art and music and um, social skills development as well. Mm -hmm. so. And Heartsy. The name? <laughs> yeah, Heartsy. How'd you come up with that name? <laughs> I'm just cheesy like that, I guess. No. <laughs> um, I really like the idea of the art in the heart and so okay. um, I just wanted to create a name that was fun that really emphasized the heart and I think it's so easy as clinicians and um, professionals to, f to forget that component right. and to forget this holistic um, approach to, to reaching the soul and the heart of these kids that perhaps can't communicate for themselves. And I would imagine too with with the arts being taken out of schools mm -hmm. more and more, even if you were a child that could find uh, a safe harbor in, in expressing yourself through the arts, you don't have that option as much anymore in the school right. systems. With our current curriculum, um, it, you can see that while we're putting in the most effort in public education, every child is so uniquely and divinely created, it's impossible mm -hmm. to meet the needs of every child. Mm -hmm. And so what I've created is, is a curriculum. It's, it's not academic based at this point. Um, it's supposed to be supplemental and enrichment experience for children who 
need to alleviate some of that stress and that anxiety and that pressure because they maybe don't understand like their peers understand. They don't learn at the pace their peers are learning. And so um, basically I just wanted to, to create a curriculum that would supplement whatever services they're already getting, um, but also individualize to meet each child's need on a smaller scale. Now, if a child were to come to you, is there some assessment you would do to say they need more of one thing versus another, or would you just sort of observe them to see where their kind of interests were and mm -hmm. play to that? How, how would you go about that? So it's what, what's interesting is, um, as an ABA therapist, we're very data-oriented. Everything is about assessments, it's about data, it's about um, goals, goal writing and, you know, graphs, and which is wonderful because we learn a lot about, you know, where children are at in terms of skill level. Um, but in terms of an assessment, it's more of um, anecdotal. And so observation and getting to know each child that's there. And there's a reason that I am creating a fully inclusive program so that these children who perhaps are isolated in our school system in a special education classroom gain exposure to neurotypical peers mm -hmm. and those peers also gain exposure to dynamically diverse um, peers and so um, yeah I hope that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I got it. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> that was a lot of verbiage there. <laughs> That's okay. But, but I think it's, it's, it's also you know translating your understanding from a, a clinical perspective to a layperson's perspective who has a child or a right. parent who has a child who may be in need and doesn't know how to quite cross that gap and it sounds like what you're creating is much more inviting uh, for a parent to be able to navigate through that. Now you said as we were talking earlier that you plan to launch your program in June yes. of 2016 an and you have a location shortly. in mind. <laughs> So for those who are watching, tell us what's about to happen and how, if they're interested, they can get involved. Sure. On June 18th will actually be my grand opening ceremony. Um, we are going to be subleasing just for the summer inside of Maid and Long Beach. Mm -hmm. And the reason I chose on, Pine Avenue, on Pine, 240 Pine Avenue, okay. um, the grand opening will be from 12 to 3. There'll be a local band there. There'll be arts and crafts. And Are you performing? I won't be performing because oh, I want to make sure I'm investing in, you know, <laughs> potential... Okay students and I want right. parents to come and be able to talk. I may sing a song or two there you because go. See? I can't help myself. There's a <laughs> guitar there. But um, yeah, it's it's going to be very interesting because it's an existing business. Right. Um, but the reason I chose that space was because it, I felt that it really represented Long Beach. Right. And that's why I came here. Mm -hmm. Localism and um, creating opportunity within this community and building each other. Mm -hmm. I felt that that was a really great space to try and launch this program um, that will I'll be starting June 27th. Who can so, participate in the program? What's the age group? What are the criteria? Um, from in the AM shift they, there are openings for children from three and a half to five years of age okay. and then from six to ten years of age in the midday program and if there's enough enrollment then there'll be another opening for just open art and play for all ages. And it's open to children, general education students, special education students. Um, I've tried to make it affordable for disadvantaged youth to where um, if I'm able to get enough funding, because right now I'm only privately funded, um, to be able to scholarship and, and provide you know, sliding scale fees and make it open on a broader scale to, to all children in our so community. So two questions then. What would be a typical uh, day? What would it entail, and what would be the cost in case someone's watching and would like to know? Sure. For summer, it's a two-hour program. Okay. Um, the way that I've created the program, it's center rotations between 20 and 25 minutes each. So they're constantly moving in motion. And in those rotations, they gain exposure to collaborative group projects, okay. um, building from materials, random materials, and just kind of creating whatever it is that they feel is art to them but they also get to move into that structured art instruction um, at the table. And just that exposure, it's not about product, it's not about pressure, it's not about creating a uniform piece. However, it's important for these kids to, to have a little bit of structure and gain that exposure to comprehension and following instructions with whatever level of prompting is needed. 
Um, and then moving on from there, there's a play area and there's a sensory area where there's tactile bins where they can stick their hands in the rice and Play-Doh and, and just kind of get that input um, bounce and um, I've seen that beneficial for all children. I think some of these terms we limit to special needs, but really all children need that sensory input, you know, to some level, to and some the degree. Cost? Are you the cost right now is twenty dollars per day. And so it ends up being ten dollars per hour. Um, so in a sense I'm not really getting paid this summer. <laughs> but I really wanted to create the opportunity to be affordable, you know, when you're comparing with other programs that exist out there currently. You're not getting paid, but your your value is priceless oh, and what you're giving you. back to them. So if I'm a parent or uh, you know, a citizen that knows of someone who might benefit from this, how would they even go about contacting you to to sign up and, and find out more information? Is there a website? Absolutely. Is there there, email, um, social media? Yes, all, of, just, all of those things. Yeah, I, just, I, just <laughs> I am on all friend. social like, media things. I know. You um, just sent out a request to me. Of like, <laughs> I did. I just friended yeah, you today. today. Thanks for but accepting. But we got one minute, so give us that information. Sure. Make um, sure we get it in. Absolutely. The oh. website is heartsy, H-E-A-R-T-S-Y, development.org. Okay. Um, there's also a Facebook page if you look it up uh, with the name Heartsy Comprehensive Development. It'll pop up um, and you can also send an email to heartseadevelopment at gmail.com. And, and if they correspond with you via email or otherwise, you can answer any questions Absolutely, they might have. yes. Okay. Email is great. The website actually has a link where you can register and pay on the site. Uh, so. It's been such a pleasure to, uh, to meet you and learn more about you and looking forward to seeing more about what you do in the community. Will you come back and see us? Absolutely. Next time you'll sing a song? Maybe. Uh, <laughs> Only if you sing with me. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> that concludes our show. I'd like to thank Wesley Gear and Yegi Kayala Watts for joining us today. Be sure to follow PadNet TV on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for the latest updates. We also welcome your comments and thoughts regarding this show as we strive to make Long Beach Lens a favorite source of local news, information, and entertainment. This show has been brought to you with support from the Long Beach Community Action Partnership. Thank you for watching Long Beach Lens. Mm -hmm.